I'm getting a lot of feedback noise. I hear it as well. Sounds better. Yes. Yeah, much better. Are we doing video? Yes, this whole thing is going to be recorded. It's going to be available via Department of Public Health YouTube page and the Fresno Madera Medical Society's page as well. Are they seeing our cameras though? Um, unless you have your camera feed on and you're speaking, that's the only way uh, someone's camera feed should come up. Otherwise, everyone's seeing um, the PowerPoint slide deck. Hi, Harvey. Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to, uh, to welcome everybody and thank you for taking, taking this time. Uh, on behalf of our president, Don Gady, uh, at the Med uh, Fresno Madera Medical Society, uh, we would like to welcome uh, you all to the Physician Forum COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we would especially like to thank Dr. Vora and his team uh, not only join, for joining us today uh, to share this valuable information, but for their tireless efforts um, during this pandemic. We greatly appreciate their frequent and thorough communication with all stakeholders, uh, their proactive approach to getting the job done, uh, and their agility in adapting to this ever-changing set of challenges. Um, again, thank you all for taking your time uh, on a Saturday uh, to participate. And I'll go ahead and turn this over uh, to Fresno County Department of Public Health to begin. Uh, Dave? Great, thanks. Hey, Dr. Vore, do you want to open up with any comments? Oh, I, you know, I'm just so thrilled this is happening. Um, it's something we threw together in very short time. And huge kudos to Stacy Woods uh, and to our communications team at Public Health for helping to organize this webinar. Hopefully, it won't be the last collaboration between Public Health and the Fresno Madera Medical Society. I think that is such a great partnership. And we just thank all of you for spending your Saturday mornings with us. We've put together, I think, an amazing program that is so vital right now. As you know, we're part of the largest vaccine rollout in human history. Uh, and Fresno County is certainly doing our part uh, to make sure that we get vaccines out to the population. And um, all of you are, are going to partner with us. So we can't wait to share everything that we've learned in a few short and hectic weeks um, about how to get this right. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to answer your questions. Just by way of the structure of today, we've got, um, I think four or five uh, mini lectures, um, which will um, end right at 11 um, or, or right before 11. And then, um, and then we'll have a Q and A session. So instead of making the Q and A at the very end of the two hour block, we're gonna have two Q and A's, um, one uh, between 10.50 and 11, and another one at the end um, around 11.50. So you can save your questions until then, you can put them in the chat. Thank you for all of you who have actually contributed questions during the registration. We have received those and we will definitely answer all of those questions. Uh, and with that, I just wanna uh, introduce um, really the, the, the leader of our, of our public health department, um, the director uh, of public health, Dave Pomaville. Um, he's been uh, really at the forefront of the whole pandemic response, and um, I really wanted him to kick off this webinar just to talk about the overall goals of vaccination and, and what we think our timelines should be, um, just to give everybody kind of a framework and a context for how we're proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bora, and, and thank you so much for your continued leadership and commitment to the community. It's been uplifting to, to see how we've been able to move through this, and uh, we, we definitely look forward to the um, I, I wanted to just talk for a minute about, um, well, first of all, the presentation. Uh, we've put together 95 some slides here. So my, my team is over, they're overachievers. And particularly to be here on a Saturday doing this work, um, they're, they're very committed to this project. So, um, but hang on. And I, I think we will share the-, the, the Yes, uh, off, off the bat, we'll share out the slides and we'll share out the recording. So just kick back and absorb as much information as you can. And if you don't get something on the first pass, just remember all of this will be shared with you uh, in very short order. Thank you. So um, just to start off, you know, the task at hand, Fresno County is about a million people 
And uh, we know that not everyone um, needs the vac vaccine or can take the vaccine. And so for planning purposes, you know, we've come up with a planning estimate of about targeting 550,000 people to be vaccinated by August 1st. And there's a lot of variables that go into making that happen. But we have to remember that um, we have about 870,000 people that are over age 18. If we estimate that 70% would take the vaccine, uh, that reduces the number. And then we've got our federal partners that are doing a lot of vaccinations right now as well. And we wanna support them as best we can to be successful because they're doing all vaccinations right now in our uh, elder living facilities and skilled nursing facilities and so forth. So really we're talking today about, you know, how do we, how do we, how are we thinking as a department of public health rolling out the, um, the, the vaccine distribution plan? Next slide, Sim. So we, we really have a couple of different distribution lanes that we are developing and have developed. One of them are, are what we would call mass vaccination sites. It's those locations where we would do high throughput per day, 500 to 1500 people, um, you know, bringing them in, uh, following the tier system, groups at a time, and so forth. And so you've seen in the news that we're set up at the fairgrounds. We've got United Healthcare Centers doing some work out at Central High School. We've got um, uh, the Spine Orthopedic Center doing a drive-through clinic. So those are those are going to kind of be the backbone of um, the initial rollout, particularly getting the the vulnerable populations um, dealt with, as well as the higher tiers. And then we see the state helping us to um, convert some of the testing sites that we've had in place. Uh, there, that's through a company called OptumServe. Uh, we see them, they're actually piloting some distribution, vaccine distribution models right now in California. And we see them as, as a critical piece where people will make their own appointment. They will have to be in one of the tiers that's, uh, that's getting vaccine. And, uh, and then they would be able to schedule an appointment to go in and get the vaccine there. And we see those sites being distributed throughout Fresno County. Remembering we have 15 incorporated cities. We've got about half of the people in the Fresno Clovis metropolitan area. And then the, the rest of the population is spread out throughout Fresno County. So we won't go into a lot of details today about that plan, but just know that we plan to have uh, these high throughput distribution sites set up in all parts of Fresno County. But then what's also really critical are targeting particular populations and programs. And we've already started that by, you know, deploying vaccine to the hospitals and they took care of doing all their healthcare workers and the behavioral health system got started. And then the behavioral health system went on to go ahead and do their partners, their contracted providers. And now they're working with some of their elder population. And the same is true with the department of social services who have all of the in-home support service providers. These are pe people that are paid to be a healthcare provider in the home for a loved one. And so they are all being vaccinated. And that's a population of, of about 20,000 people in the provider side, and then another 20,000 on the um, patient side. And we're doing our emergency response providers and so forth. And we will roll out targeted um, programs for large employers. So we are talking to the Cargill Meats and the Foster Farms and Bee Sweet Citrus type programs where it makes sense to do the education program for the vaccine through their workforce, working with their employee health programs, and then likely bringing on um, uh, uh, clinics, to, you know, either operated by the employer or, or by the county to actually do the vaccinations at those locations. And so we've had a lot of outbreaks in some of the large congregate settings, and we want to match that with the vaccine distribution. So a lot of people will get their vaccine that way. And then, you know, the primary care system, really, we hope that they're able to pick up a lot of the older patients, the 65 and older populations, uh, working within the tier structure. And some of the, the pr providers have relationships with employers. And so uh, for the, the smaller employers, we think that that's going to be a, a good way for a, uh, an employer to, to partner up with a clinical provider and go ahead and do some of the essential workforce and then obviously going on to the general population. So um, this is a, <laughs> the way I'm thinking about how this rollout looks and it, there's, a, there's um, not a lot of detail for you to see here, but if you just look at a timeline versus the distribution of vaccine, the colors represent a different type of uh, distribution system. So the, uh, going from the bottom up, 
we have that bottom, which is going to be those mass distribution sites. And then you can see like the goldenrod color where we're starting a clinic. It runs for a while. It deals with its population, and then it drops off. But the most important part, if you go to the next slide, is that upper group. And so over time, we see more and more vaccine being available to our primary care providers. And this is a back of the napkin rough estimate, but we are looking at you know, the, the uh, primary care providers getting into a pace of doing about 20,000 vaccinations per week across all of their patient base. And that, um, that you know, really over the, 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 this initial response, they could end up doing about 40% of the vaccinations. We don't know that that's exactly how that number is gonna look. We're, we're, we're projecting this. Um, we're certain that there's gonna be adjustments and changes, but I think that we will have um, distributions through all of these lanes as we go through, um, really through the summer months. Uh, next slide. We face some big challenges today in, in implementing that program we just showed you. First is the vaccine availability. We're already compressed. Um, I know there's a lot of talk out there about who has vaccine and who doesn't. The bottom line is, is we are getting it out as quickly as we're getting it. We are trying to balance the holding second doses to make sure that we've got the particular vulnerable populations. We have second doses available for them. We know that there's a lot of patient education that needs to be done, and there's a lot of frustration right now. So we're trying to be as um, open with regard to our planning, and we're trying to communicate with our teams, our people about um, the vaccine programs that are to come. And that will hopefully, you know, if people know, okay, I have an understanding of when I can, when, when I'm going to be up, that that will help to deal with some of that frustration. And to be quite frank, we are, you know, we have some direction changes between the state and federal government. Uh, Dr. Vore and I are on a call on a regular basis, and it, it just feels like we're going left and then right, and we're zigging and zagging. We have to have a local plan to work against. So we hope that the federal government and state government are able to step in and provide resources to help us do this. But if not, we've got to have a plan in place that we can, we can implement. Um, so I expect there's going to be some changes with regard to the new administration at the federal level. And then really the desire for California to not be on the 50th uh, rank of distribution of vaccine, but being the first. And we know there's a challenge with regard to the payment structure. You know, how, how are we prioritizing healthcare? Um, we're asking for providers to set aside other uh, um, payments to be able to, or, or other uh, billable services to be able to do uh, the, the vaccinations. And so while there is an administration fee, we know that these drive-through clinics are very expensive to operate and they can be very efficient, but they're also expensive to operate and there's not a good payment structure for that. We're being assured we've gotten um, th that started up with, with some of our local providers, and we expect there'll be more to come uh, through the state on, on how uh, there may be incentives to get these vaccines out. And I think our call to action, you know, really uh, today is to do what we've been doing throughout the pandemic, which is to learn from each other, work together, and really to respond as best we can as a connected healthcare system. And, and I know it's frustrating every day when you get up and you want to solve a problem and, and, and the barriers are oftentimes very high. But we've been able to do a lot of really good work because we've been able to, you know, stay connected with one another, be informed, learn from each other, and, and do the best we can to have the, the rollout of the vaccine be as connected as possible and really understanding that we've got to address the diversity of our community, that the, the, we have to meet people in the language that they speak, in the community that they, that they live and work in, and, and that's gonna take really working together. And then we're encouraging you today to become enrolled as a provider, be a lot more discussion about that. And so that we can rapidly, you know, do distribution to our community, to our populations that are most at risk initially, and then more broadly. My goal for our team here in Fresno County is build capacity beyond our ability to, uh, for the vaccine, so that we can keep asking for more and more and more. On Monday, um, we are going to be rolling out a, you know, the initial parts of a, of a program that would be able to, to target our uh, um, farm worker pro, uh, programs and ag employers because they've been one of the priorities. We don't have enough vaccine to do to even start that, but we know we've got to get smarter about how we can deploy. So when the vaccine is ready, we're ready to meet that challenge. 
And then I think the final message we want to send as the, the Department of Public Health today is, you know, if we work together, we can end this pandemic. And I can tell you, it has been very uplifting to as frustrating as the vaccine rollout has been, it's been very uplifting to spend time at the fairgrounds and at the, at, at, at the provider clinics, seeing the faces of people that are getting the vaccine. You know, initially it was the healthcare workers and now it's our senior populations and they are so extraordinarily grateful. And um, I know we are, we are gonna really deliver a high quality product to them as we move forward. So um, with that, again, thank you all for being here. And I think I'll turn it over to my team. I think Scotty Blanks is the, um, the next speaker who's been awesome in all of this. Thank you, Dave. Good morning. So my name is Scotty Blanks. I'm the supervising public health nurse over the immunization program for Fresno County. Um, and this morning, I'm going to be going through the three uh, registries that are required um, for COVID vaccine providers. So the first one there listed is CARE. So that's California's immunis immunization registry. The next is CalVax. This system was formerly COVID ready. Um, the state's done away with that. So now it's the CalVax system and that's to enroll in California's COVID vaccine. Um, and then the next one is Vaccine Finder. So this is CDC site and they are requiring that every uh, COVID vaccine provider submit their inventory daily. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about care. So all COVID vaccinations must be entered into care within 24 hours, right? So that means you administer today, by this time tomorrow, it must already be input into care. So if you are not a site that is already an enrolled provider, the, the quickest way to get through um, it, to be ready to submit that data into care is one, um, visit the careweb.org slash COVID. And that will guide you through becoming a, an approved or enrolled provider for care. And then the next step, there, there are lots of options for how you enter into care, but the quickest way is using the MassFax module. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see in green, it just it says quickest use the care to MassFax online application. Thank you. So as soon as you have your organization code come back from care, so that's at this point, they're asking for a five to 10 day um, turnaround time for those. So once you've submitted it, hopefully they'll get it back to you in 10 days. So once you have that, immediately send um, requests for access for your staff to this MassFax um, email address. So on there, you can see, well, you'll see bigger on the page, but MassFax at cdph.ca.gov. And those, the turn, thank you. The turnaround time for those is about 24 to 48 hours. And there's no training required for that one. And it's just a really simple, straightforward Excel sheet. So that's the fastest way to be ready for care. All right, so once you have your care org code, then the next page, we can go to the next slide. So it's CalVax. So that's the new site. So it's calvax.cdph.ca.gov. And then, um, so this, again, this COVID ready is what you heard, be, heard of before, but that's gone and done away with as of about a week or two ago. So the landing page for CalVax will walk you through the six steps of becoming a COVID vaccine provider. So step, step one noted there is enrolling in care. Step two is reviewing your storage and equipment and whether or not it meets CDC's requirements. So the link on this page takes you to CDC's storage and handling toolkit. So you'll find detailed information, um, requirements for your refrigerators, your freezers, your temperature monitoring devices. Step three is the enrollment worksheet. So this is a printable document where you pre-fill all of the information that's required in the actual, um, required for the actual um, application. So step four, it says notify contacts, but that's really um, just submitting your documentation onto the website um, and uh, your, also with an e-signature from your CMO and CEO. And then step five um, is, is meeting the training requirements. And step six is staying up to date with California's latest um, guidance and resources for the COVID vaccine program. So the next slide, thanks. The enrollment worksheet is a printable document. So this tool will walk you through gathering information that will be needed to complete the online enrollment form later. Once you have that all ready, then you start creating an account on CalVax. Section A in CalVax reviews um, the CDC's provider agreement. 
And in this section, you'll submit key practice information, such as the address for your location and the primary contacts for your immunization coordinators. You'll also submit, this is where you have to submit the e-signatures for your CMO and CEO. You won't be able to move on past this section until you get those e-signatures submitted. So having your CMO and CEO uh, ready to help you with that um, beforehand is, is a key piece in expediting this process. Section B is submitting information for your site. So this is where you submit your population that's being served, the storage equipment, such as um, your, your fridge, freezer, if you have a, an ultra low temp freezer, um, data logger equipment goes there, as well as the list of all of the names and licenses of the providers for your location. So the CalVac site, um, so once you've created your account, you'll be asked to attest that your key staff have completed the training as required by CDPH. Um, and, and additional training and resources can be found at the state's um, EZIZ website. So that's easyiz.org slash COVID. So once your location is approved by the state, uh, both your practice and the health department will be notified. And then we will reach out to you to do a site visit. So Fresno County, so the next slide. Thanks. So Fresno County site visit team will contact your immunization coordinator to arrange both a virtual meeting and an on-site vaccine storage evaluation. After your site has been approved, the vaccine distribution team will be notified that you are eligible to receive vaccine. On the right side here, you see the following items are required prior to scheduling an on-site visit. So we need to know the model and serial number for the storage units you have. So that's your refrigerators and freezers and then all of the information for your temperature monitoring equipment. So that's the brand model serial number for the data logger. And I would note that the CDC does require that um, each site has backup temperature monitoring devices. We, we also require that um, the calibration certificates for the data loggers are submitted to us prior to the site visit, as well as an emailed copy of your unit's paper temperature monitoring log. So this is the piece of paper on the, that's like posted to the outside of your refrigerator that shows your staff for checking the temperatures um, at least once or twice a day. So now we'll go to the third registry, which is CDC's. So this is Vaccine Finder. So um, after being approved in CalVax, your location's information is submitted to CDC. So once they receive that, either this, the state or the or CDC, they'll be, they'll be submitting your authorization to become an enrolled vaccine finder site. And then they will be sending you um, the access email. And it will come from vaccine finder at auth.castinglighthealth.com. I, I would say a lot of providers are having trouble um, getting this email. So please make sure that your, your primary vaccine coordinator listed on your CalVax application that coordinator needs to be watching their junk mail and perhaps um, talking with IT about watching for that um, email address. So a lot of providers are, are not getting that email address because it's getting filtered out. If you do have um, trouble getting this email, uh, reach out to the state. Um, and then training videos for this are available at um, vaccinefinder.org. Um, um, unfortunately, the CDC does require that this um, inventory is submitted every single day, including the weekends, even when your clinic is closed. Um, they, it doesn't seem like they're going to change this guidance, so it's important that you're prepared to meet those requirements um, as they're currently stated. And it is a very simple process. Um, it takes about five minutes or less as long as you have um, have your inventory. Okay, just needs to stay outside. And then we'll go on to the last one. So the next slide. So the COVID call center. So if you have questions about enrolling the, into the California COVID-19 vaccine program, you can reach out to your state. Um, reach out to the state at COVID call center at cdph.ca.gov. There's also a phone number there. And it's they're open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. We look forward to having um, a site visit with you guys.
morning, everybody. Um, this uh, this is uh, Joe Prado, division manager with the department. I'm going to speak to you about cold chain management here. And, you know, really, I'm hoping to kind of de debunk some myths out there as far as um, what does it actually take to actually become a, a vaccine provider and what does cold chain really look like in the real world here. And so I just wanted to give you some images here. Um, if, if you were to receive a box of vaccine in a direct shipment, that is a really good example, the size of the box. They're not uh, enormous, but it, it is something that it either um, comes in with um, dry ice with Pfizer or it comes in frozen also with, uh, with Moderna right now. Um, to the left there, you see the Pfizer data logger, um, a very key um, when you actually, if you do receive a direct shipment from Pfizer or from uh, Moderna, uh, Moderna is managed through McKesson. Um, you'll have to look at the data logger to make sure you received a good shipment. And then, um, of course, knowing the protocol, if you did not receive a good shipment, what are the next steps? And just um, at the bottom there, you'll see that the box opening up, there's a styrofoam there, dry ice um, packaged in nicely. <clears throat> and then that last image is our image of our ultra um, cold um, freezer here at Fresno County Department of Public Health. And so um, just want to get into a little bit of well, what's the responsibility of, of cold chain management when you're um, a vaccine provider? Next slide. Um, all this information I have just really summarized, all of this is located um, through the CDC's uh, vaccine storage and handling toolkit. Um, you have the web link there on the, uh, on the slide. This really gives into a lot of uh, great detail. Uh, CDC has a great, um, website also specifically with Moderna, specifically with Pfizer, and as each new vaccine gets um, approved um, within EUA, uh, CDC is really good about updating their handling toolkit and also updating their website so we know all the latest information with that. Um, and that's the thing, you'll, um, you know, the cocaine requirements that we were hearing back in, I'd say August, slightly changed as we moved um, through this response. And so, it's always good to be able to go back to the CDC um, resources there and get the latest information. Um, for a good uh, cold chain management, really well-trained staff, um, and that's, uh, Scotty mentioned that a little bit in some of her presentation as well, uh, reliable storage and temperature monitoring equipment and accurate va vaccine inventory management as well. As you kind of heard Scotty talk a little bit about vaccine finders, uh, that's part of the inventory management. Um, you heard Scotty mention the data loggers. Those are all very key components of cold chain management. Next slide. And so um, the CDC recommends having um, storage and handling standard and operating procedures. Um, those are a very um, simple standard um, um, standard uh, operating procedures we have. We could always provide you a copy of ours as well. But just really understanding um, how will you take receipt of, of the vaccine? How will you store it? Um, just a basic um, uh, operating procedure on that. And then just train your staff on those procedures. Um, how, how will you handle it? And what, what is the plan if you have a failure in your cold chain? If your refrigerator or your freezer goes down, where do you plan on actually moving that vaccine to? And, um, and if your plan is, hey, I don't have a second refrigerator or freezer, then really coordinate with our, with our team and we'll, um, we'll evaluate that um, protocol and see whether or not that is something we could actually provide for you as a backup if you lose your refrigeration or your freezer, or we could find a partner that is in your area and see if um, they have that storage capacity. Um, we have, um, we have backup freezer and refrigerator at the health department. We also have contracts with other partners in the community. So don't let that be a, a factor of you not signing on. We can definitely help you get there. Um, reliable storage and temp monitoring uh, equipment. So the digital data logger, uh, very key um, um, asset that we need to acquire. And this is something that if you're thinking about um, coming on, this is something that you uh, really need to order like now. Um, right now, we have a large order of di digital data loggers um, on order. We want to have some experts available um, out there. I think we're out to, I want to say, late March or early April on these digital data loggers. And so we'll try to go out and purchase, um, go, out, go out and purchase um, 
some additional digital data loggers if you're not a, able to get one. So, you know, when you actually have your refrigeration or your freezer unit, um, plug it into one electrical outlet. <clears throat> that that is some sounds simple, but it really is. Uh, you want to make sure you have that sole your outlet dedicated to that storage unit. For your vaccines in their original packaging, the lids close until ready for administration. That is something part of the CDC guidance. It protects uh, the vaccine um, against the light and um, against any type of uh, <clears throat> dif uh, definitive changes in your temperature in your, in your storage unit. And you check and record storage unit minimum and maximum temperatures at the start of each workday. And so that is, uh, that's part of the commitment of, of storing and um, vaccine in your freezer or your refrigerator. This is gonna be just a normal part of your work process and that's reflected in your um, standard operating procedures. Um, accurate vaccine inventory management. Immediately examine shipments for signs of damage to guarantee receipt of appropriate vaccine types and quantities. You may have um, heard um, our, we had this situation arise with us. Um, we received a Moderna shipment and we had a, I think a red, <laughs> a color red on their data logger that came in. Um, Pfizer and uh, Moderna had different processes on how we call that in. So we pretty much um, took the, that vaccine, put it in the freezer, and we're communicating with the state on what we do with that uh, particular vaccine. They're working with McKesson and they're seeing where were the, where were the potential excursion, how long was it out of range, and you'll, um, you'll get direction on what to do with that. In our situation, what we had to do, we actually had to take those vaccines, put them in the freezer, and then actually ship them back to um, McKesson and they replaced ours within a 48 hour period. Um, when, uh, so it was fairly quickly that we did receive that vaccine back. But that is just something you want to make sure to have in your procedures of checking that shipment if you receive a direct shipment. Um, order and stock only enough vaccine to meet patient needs. Um, you know, right now, because of the, um, the real um, lack of vaccine coming into Fresno County, we've directed all of our um, providers are in our hospitals. And as of last week, when you order your vaccine, store it and manage it as a first and second dose. Um, that's going to help us to really try to manage our inventory. And as we um, go through um, getting hopefully additional um, vaccines, we can actually um, relieve that requirement. But for now, that's, that's our direction to our, our medical partners at this time. Um, stock rotation. So if you're getting your vaccine, making sure um, you have a really good stock uh, rotation protocol in place. Hey, Joe, quick question. Can you move closer to the microphone or adjust your mic? Uh, we're picking up some background noise. Sorry to interrupt your- Yeah, yeah, no problem. Let me, let me try something else here, Sam. Um, is, this any, is this any better? We're getting a okay. lot of static feed in the back. We, we, okay, how's, how's this? Is this any better right now? You're easier to hear. That's better than before. Okay. Okay. I'll get really close here. Sorry about that. Next slide. Um, so um, Pfizer and Moderna are the two vaccines we have available at this time. So I just wanted to go over some general in information here and how that kind of relates to cold chain management and how that could look like in your particular office here. So Pfizer uh, Biotech um, does have the dilutant um, the sodium chloride um, that does come in as part of your ancillary supply. So that is something that is provided to you as you come on as a provider. Um, and each of those um, vials are six doses per vial. Initially, you did see some, you did see some um, five doses per vial initially, but what we have seen lately is that it's really six doses per vial. Age indications for Pfizer is 16 years of age and older. The schedule, it is a two-dose series, um, 21 days, but does allow 17 or more days after the first dose. So it does give you that leeway to actually administer on the 17th, 18th, and 19th, 20th day as well. So as you think about your clinic practice uh, and being able to store your first and second doses, you do have some flexibility on uh, bringing in the patient in a little sooner. Um, or a, a little bit later. Um, so that is uh, something that's available there. And administer intramuscular there. On the Moderna, it does not require dilutants. So your, um, your package, if you receive a direct shipment, does not include any dilutants. 
There, we're seeing 10 doses per vial, um, doses is 0.5 ml. And um, go back to that slide, um, please. And on the 10 doses per vial, they're seeing um, sometimes they can get an extra dose, um, not all the time, but they do get um, one extra dose sometimes. 18 years of age and older, two dose series, 28 days, but it does allow 24 or more days, and it is intermuscular. Next slide. Um, so Pfizer is the ultra cold storage. Uh, that is something that uh, we have um, that storage here. And so um, Pfizer, before mixing, uh, may be refrigerated. So if you actually ask for the Pfizer product, um, you can refrigerate it, and it can be um, refrigerated for up to five days for 120 hours. So if that is a product you want to administer in your clinic, um, you don't have to have ultra cold storage. So you do need to work your workflow to where you're able to administer that within five days. Uh, mixed vaccine may be left at room temperature for up to six hours, but mixed vaccine should not be returned to freezer storage, and you have to discard any remaining vaccine after six hours. Uh, Moderna, and right now Pfizer, uh, we pretty much have only distributed that to the hospitals, and um, at the Fresno Fairgrounds, we're administering Pfizer vaccine. Because of the difference um, um, in cold chain management, we've kept that um, with the county and with our hospitals. So when you um, when we work with Fox, when we work with um, United Health Centers out at Central High and all of our private clinics, um, they are given the Moderna product. And Moderna at this time we're seeing a we are receiving a larger allocation of Moderna at this time. So Moderna can be stored in a regular freezer, uh, may be refrigerated for up to 30 days. So this, this product here gives you a lot more flexibility in how you manage your clinic. Um, you can refrigerate um, that vaccine for up to 30 days. Um, and if you think about your daily practice, um, it takes about two hours, uh, two hours and 30 minutes for it to thaw in a refrigerator. But if you bring it out at room temperature, uh, about an hour, it will be thawed. Unpunctured vials may be kept <clears throat> at room temperature for um, up to 12 hours. So if you think about your practice again, you've got a lot more flexibility with the Moderna product. And after the first um, dose has been withdrawn, uh, the valves should be held between uh, at room temperature and discarded after six hours. You do not, uh, you cannot refreeze uh, that Moderna product. Next slide. So if you become a Calvax provider um, on, on the Pfizer product, you could receive up to 975 doses. That is a minimum order. And so when you think about receiving 975 doses, um, that actually, uh, you need to be able to calculate that your thoroughput, if you're um, taking it and putting it in a refrigerator, you'll need to get 975 doses out as a minimum order. Um, also, Calvax, when you are a direct provider, you will receive a nice big box of, of all the uh, ancillary supplies, the needles, the alcohol prep pad, for 975 doses. Your ancillary supplies also include the immunization card. It's the CDC white small immunization card also comes in the ancillary supplies. If you want to work the Pfizer product, if you want to work in smaller amounts, that can be arranged with the Department of Public Health. We'll just have to arrange the actual pickup and transport of that, of that product to you. And so appropriate transport cooler and digital data logger is required. So that is something that um, we'll have more information on what that um, is. It's a, um, so it's not a regular little ice test. That is only supposed to be used like an emergency situation only. There's a barrel core product of, and there's different sizes that you could actually um, transport your um, vaccine in and always a digital data logger is required. On the Moderna shipment, this is a smaller um, and more manageable. They ship direct shipment if you are a food provider. 100 doses, that is a minimum order. And you also receive the same ancillary supplies direct ship to you in 100 dose amount. And if you need smaller doses than 100, again, Department of Public Health, we can assist you uh, in giving you those smaller doses. And again, you would need uh, an appropriate transport cooler and digital data logger would be required. And I believe that is that ends my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Joe. Sorry about some of the noise issues. Um, we'll, we'll share out these slides and um, hopefully a brief transcript of Joe's talk um, and uh, apologize about the background noise with that one. Um, next up, I think, do we have Curtis? Or I know Curtis is actually on double duty because he's actually managing the fairgrounds today as well. Um, and so uh, I think maybe Dr. Brox was going to make these remarks, is that right? I'm available if, if uh, Curtis isn't on the call. Oh, okay. Well, either way, I, I didn't. I didn't know. So go ahead. Sure. Uh, good morning. My name is Tim Brox. I'm uh, uh, working with uh, Curtis, and uh, basically, I'm going to give you know, some of the things that Curtis has taught me. And the um, and uh, it, it's always uh, best to have somebody that really knows what they're doing. And Curtis certainly falls into that category. Um, the when you're organized, when you're setting up a vaccination program, it is important that you consider the, the uh, objective of your team and the, the team is scalable. Uh, we've heard a, a lot of information this morning about the various steps. Um, we've, uh, Dave has mentioned that there are several uh, types of uh, vaccination teams that, that are, are going to be there, going to be used. Uh, we've got set up the mass vaccination site and I'll tell you a little bit about how that's organized. There's also, uh, we're working to have uh, uh, community mobile teams to go into uh, long-term uh, residences. We're also uh, looking at uh, the various types of on-site vaccinations um, and, um, and, and community outreach uh, programs. And then lastly, there, we've got the offices and, and the clinics. Uh, next slide. Uh, functionally, uh, it's important that um, you break down your, your team site. We've heard about the uh, vac vaccination inventory and transport and the cold chain. It's important to have an on-site team leadership. The functions are broken down between uh, basically about four, four steps. You've got registration, you've got uh, the uh, vaccination uh, team per se, you've got the observation team. The observation program is important for this um, uh, vaccination because of the potential for immediate um, uh, allergic response, and then you've got your checkout. Uh, we would recommend that uh, going forward, whenever possible, as part of the uh, checkout process, that the appointment for the second uh, uh, injection be made. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, it, it's really best if all people uh, involved in this have either advanced training or prior knowledge. Uh, we we uh, were involved with using volunteers and using people from different parts of the county who are in, in involved in other programs. And we put together a package of material that they go through in advance of uh, showing up on the site. And this is very helpful. At the same time, when people arrive at the site, we're careful to make sure that they're, uh, that they're given an orientation and that they're uh, mentored uh, as, as we move forward. It's the, the, uh, we, we spent a lot of time on the cold chain and handling of the inventory. If we uh, don't uh, go through the uh, process of, of uh, screening, documentation, injection, and observation and recording, then we haven't uh, uh, met the whole uh, process of the, cool, of, the, uh, of the program. Next slide, please. So uh, the mass vaccination site is set up in, in an incident command uh, structure, and in this this is important to, to note. Uh, Curtis is the is the boss down there. He does a great job. Uh, when uh, people are uh, involved in these different areas, for instance, specifically in the vaccination lead, every licensed person L is simply part of the uh, vaccination team, and they all work as part of that vaccination uh, team. Um, and this will have, uh, you know, this is part of our our. Uh, uh, bringing in people from other areas and the volunteers, which I'll talk about later. So the different areas include the, the, the site traffic, the uh, registration uh, person, the, uh, the uh, vaccination uh, team, which invol involves also the draw up uh, and the drawing up table, the, ta the uh, vaccination we recommend uh, for the larger sites that, that uh, the uh, actual vaccination injection be separated from the uh, drawing up of the vaccine. And then we use runners to get from the draw up table to the vaccination area. In the observation area, it's important that there actually be an observation, not just a holding area and 
because uh, the, there is the potential for uh, people to um, uh, collapse uh, sort of unexpectedly. Uh, uh, so far, things have gone very well at the, uh, at the fairgrounds, but we have had several basal vagal incidents. And then at checkout, we've already talked about that. Next slide, please. Uh, again, I emphasize that at the site, there's the leadership folks, and then there's just two job descriptions, clinical and clerical. And the clinical involves all of the authorized vaccinate, uh, vaccination, uh, licensed vaccinators in the, uh, in the state, and, I'm, and that does include our, our dentists. Next slide. So this is what a um, mobile uh, community vaccination team for about 300 would look like. It would really be a team of about um, 20 people, half of them being uh, uh, clinical and half of them being uh, so-called clerical. Uh, and you've got the different areas that I've mentioned before, and we can provide these uh, 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 slides and information. Uh, certainly, the, uh, uh, we're glad to work with any uh, partners and uh, provide information about uh, exactly uh, what's, what's required on, on site. And this, of course, will vary uh, depending on the exact uh, circumstances, whether this is an occupational clinic, whether this is a community clinic where we're bringing the whole team or are, are all the different um, different variations. Next slide, please. I think that's, I think those are, um, and certainly in the question and answer, I'll try to do my best to uh, stand in for Curtis, um, uh, but certainly um, he, he's the, uh, he's, he's been an excellent mentor and, ex and uh, he's a, a very uh, experienced uh, um, uh, person in regarding to uh, running an uh, incident site. Thank you, Dr. Brox. Um, I agree, Curtis is a, a local treasure and, and we definitely value all of his contributions. Uh, and he's in, in, on duty today, which is why um, uh, he wasn't able to present this. Um, Dr. Brox, we've, we've brought him on recently, but he has um, also just really bloomed like a flower and he's overseeing our volunteers, um, clinical volunteers mainly. So it, for those of you who are asking, you know, office-based vaccination seems a little complicated. I just wanna help do this um, if I can just show up somewhere. We have a mechanism for that. And uh, you know, Sim can actually drop the link in the chat um, so that you can see where it, where it is. Um, and, and although that's not the focus of this webinar, uh, please rem remember that that is available for clinicians, um, whatever your time commitment is. And Dr. Brox will be working with you closely to um, get you oriented about you know, where we need folks and, and how you can get started um, as soon as you're ready. I think with that, um, we will, um, we, we will um, put a pause on the presentations uh, because it is um, uh, 1050 and, and then just do a Q&A session um, just to help, help you digest all of the information that you've been given, uh, give you a chance to answer questions um, and, and ask our panelists um, really about anything that they've just discussed. So uh, if you could, I'm not sure how best to do this. I've been looking at the chat and um, there's been some good questions asked about the, in the chat. So uh, just in the interest of time, I don't think that we'll, um, we'll, we'll go through those, but we will summarize those and, and share those out whenever we send out the rest of the materials. Um, and uh, otherwise, if there's anyone who has any questions, please unmute yourself and, um, and go ahead. Thank you. And, and we'll keep this going for about 10 minutes. If we're only supposed to use 50% um, of our doses, so say we get a shipment from Moderna and we administer 50% of the doses and we need to save the other 50% for four weeks from now, are we able to order more doses in the interim? Yeah, um, this is Joe Prado. Is my sound coming through better now? Um, no, not really, Joe. Okay. You may have to yell into your mic. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, yeah. You can um, every week you can place an order um, through the through Calvax, and our team's going to be evaluating um, who we've um, who we um, sent vaccine to, how much of the allocation do we have coming through, and really looking at it through the equity lens as well as, for instance, this past week we uh, allocated to the federally qualified health centers. So. Some of the vaccines that we have but uh, if you're a new provider coming on 
So definitely want to get you uh, vaccine just so you can start priming your system and be ready for the larger allotments as we move forward. Hey, Joe, it's Dave. I have a question about how we're thinking about primary care providers doing their 65 and older patients. Is that something we've asked them to think about, you know, letting us know how many 65 and overs they have that they may be able to do at their office if they had the vaccine? Yeah. Uh, great comment, Dave. So if, if that is something if, if you start to ask for vaccine, if you already have a census and you know your patients want the vaccine, that is great information for us to have as we look at um, prioritizing our vaccine uh, out in the community. Sorry, I, I would add that the CalVax ordering process, I'm not quite sure that that's entirely set up yet by the state system. So orders should still be coming to um, the COVID vaccine email box. So that's COVID vaccine at FresnoCountyCA.gov. And I'll put that in the chat. Someone's asking, uh, maybe Dave could answer about um, compensation to provide vaccinations and how that, that would work. Um, I'm assuming from like a, a primary care provider or an ambulatory care provider perspective. Do you wanna comment on that, Dave? Sure, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so the CMS system for Medicaid and Medicare have established a um, administration rate at 1690 for the first dose and 28 and change for the second dose. Um, so I think it averages out to about $22 per, per dose that's administered. Um, I would expect that if you're, if you're providing a vaccine as part of a routine checkup, um, that would probably cover the cost or uh, maybe, maybe not enough. Maybe that's, that's not quite enough, but, but I don't think that's enough to cover, you know, you stopping all of your operation and setting up a, a clinic site for 500 people to come through. So um, we are uh, working, trying to identify with the state an opportunity to say, look, if you're willing and able to put on a larger high throughput publicly available um, site, we, we need to find some compensation for you to help offset some of those costs. So we've challenged the state to come up with a um, incentive for that. They've told us they're working on it. Um, I can tell you that we have already done some work with United Healthcare Center, SPOC, uh, and it seemed like a third one, to, just to get them going on some of the drive-through sites. So um, I'm not sure that that, 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 that that fee structure will be in place for a long term, but we just had to get something started. And other counties are doing the same thing. So we're not sure that the, that the, the published rate of $16 for the first dose and $20 for the second is adequate to really do a pandemic level of, of vaccination. So, um, but I'd love to hear any comments if somebody has a, has a comment about that. I know that we have one, one provider that is coming to us and saying, if we can bill insurance or we can bill um, HRSA for any uncompensated care, they think they can break even by running a high throughput clinic. And so we're trying to see whether they can, they can actually pull that off. But I'd love to hear feedback on uh, if there's anything with regard to the rate structure. Um, Dave, what about a couple of people have asked about liability protections. Um, and I guess we haven't really discussed this. You know, my, my instinct is that this is, this is sort of like other vaccinations. Um, clinically, it's very low risk, um, as I'll talk about in the next lecture. Um, and, um, and beyond that, um, it should be covered in the same way that other, like if you provide flu vaccinations uh, or uh, you, you know, strep pneumonia vaccination, that it would fall under the same kind of liability protection. Um, is that accurate or have you heard anything else? Yeah, th that is accurate. And I think that um, when we, for normal operations, and then I, I think that, um, so, if you're a risk manager, you think about the worst case scenario and then you, and then you multiply times 10, right? So 
you know, if you're setting up a, a public clinic in your parking lot, you know, what happens if somebody gets hit by a car when they're coming through? Or what happens if something else happens? So we have um, put together agreements with providers that has some risk transfer language, but it also, you know, because we are in a, a, a local and state declared emergency, there are additional protections that are provided for um, entities like the, the Department of Public Health and providers that are working at their direction um, to address, uh, you know, uh, situations that may come up. So there's a, there's a lot of protections in, in that regard. Um, it's the same thing with the, the people who are volunteering. They are they would sign up as a disaster service worker, and there are uh, again because we are in a declared uh, public health emergency, there are liability protections um, that are that are provided for uh, for those individuals that are working. Yeah, lots of other good questions in the chat, and we will try to get to them. Um, I think we're going to move forward and um, and just start the next section, and uh, we'll try to track down um, things like insurance codes and um, some of the other questions that you had. Um, otherwise, please feel free. I think we're sharing our emails uh, to email us in the meantime, especially if you have questions about the cold chain. Uh, Joe and Scotty and the rest of the team are experts at this. And it will save you a lot of internet time if you just email us instead of trying to dig through and try to find the answers. Um, so uh, feel free to do that, especially if you have questions about, um, I know somebody's asking about the shelf life of the Pfizer vials and things like that. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm ready to talk about adverse reactions and allergies, which I know is a big uh, topic of concern in the general population and perhaps among some of you. Before I do that though, um, I think we have a little bit of time and we just wanted to discuss another really special um, program, uh, not really related to vaccination, but, uh, but definitely related to COVID. Uh, so we've asked Dr. Zweifler to just present, um, there's no slides with this. He's just gonna talk about a, a few minutes about monoclonal antibodies, what they are, how they can be used in COVID patients and where perhaps um, you could um, uh, fit this into your practice. Uh, Dr. Zweifler is, um, He's really a jack of all trades. He's, he's, he's been there, done that for just about anything you can name. And now he's helping us at Public Health and we are so blessed and honored to have him. So if you're ready, Dr. Zweifler, please take it away and, and share uh, just a few minutes about monoclonal antibodies and why this is such a great program for people to know about. Well, thanks, Dr. Vora. And I think it is important to think about monoclonal antibodies, uh, both in the context of uh, this vaccine effort uh, uh, which includes both the, the mass vaccine sites uh, uh, for the general populace, the, uh, the potential to, for mobile, mobile units to hit specific areas uh, and uh, large employers, uh, as, but, and then particularly the healthcare providers who can provide more of this kind of personalized, customized approach uh, to reaching our highest risk patients that, that, are, that you know in your practice. Uh, but this is also occurring in the, with the backdrop of the biggest surge that we have seen uh, with, with COVID. And it's so tough because we can see just around the corner is the hope and the potential that, that is associated with the vaccines that are to really, to really get, us, uh, get us through this pandemic. But in the meantime, we're dealing with this surge and, and uh, with very limited treatment options. Uh, uh, you know, our hospitals are providing great uh, supportive care for folks who are in the hospital, but they're not great. Uh, they're really not great treatments. Uh, but there is one intervention that is out there that can really make an impact on reducing the number of people who end up in the emergency rooms in our hospitals, and that is the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so the, ma the monoclonal antibodies basically basically give you a shot of immune system uh, to fight uh, that are targeted specifically to fight off this virus. Uh, this is a, uh, a new uh, a new treatment uh, 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 a new treatment in our uh, clinical armamentarium uh, and so there haven't been a lot of studies that have been done on it uh, but what the studies that have been done are extremely promising. Uh, showing rates of reduction in emergency room and hospitalization visits uh, or hospitalizations uh, for those with mild to moderate uh, symptoms of COVID uh, uh, for uh, of up to 65 to 75%, even 80% reductions uh, uh, if, if you receive the monoclonal antibody. Uh, so uh, it's an, a, in terms of 
what is it and how is it administered? It's a one-time infusion. Uh, it's given IV over a course of an hour. It can be done in your office. Uh, it can be done other settings as well, but it can be done by primary care providers uh, in their offices. And we have some uh, clinicians in the community who are doing that. Uh, uh, there is a, a reimbursement that's available. It's, really, it's uh, approved for use in high-risk patients. So if you're over 65 or if you um, have a medical uh, comorbid condition or if you're obese uh, 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 with a BMI over 35, uh, it's indicated it for each of those, um, those groups. Uh, the reports that we've gotten from providers who are using it are you know, nothing short of miraculous. They, they uh, have patients who tell them, geez, doc, you know, within a couple hours, I was feeling better. Uh, and if you think about the rates of hospitalizations and deaths in our highest risk group, you know, we can see a really meaningful, we can, uh, you can see a really meaningful difference. You're going to prevent deaths by, uh, by providing the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, there's also plenty of monoclonal antibody out there. So unlike the vaccine where we see a lot of bottlenecks, there is a lot of monoclonal antibodies. And the issue more is we just need more providers to, to, uh, who are able to uh, provide it. Uh, one other point related to that, uh, it, uh, it's recommended that it be given as soon as possible. Uh, and so within the first 10 days of diagnosis, uh, you can really facilitate diagnosing your patients. If, if, if you are using our rapid antigen cards, which you also can get from the health department. Uh, so if you have a symptomatic patient, uh, test them with the rapid antigen card right then and there in your office. Uh, and then that patient would be eligible then for, uh, if they're high risk for the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so we have more information about the monoclonal antibodies on uh, the Fresno County Department of Public Health website. Uh, if you go to the uh, Healthcare for Providers message, uh, uh, message section, uh, you'll see more information about the monoclonal antibodies, both providing it yourself, uh, as well as, uh, as some other sites in the, in the community where you can uh, refer your patients. Uh, you also will find information about the vaccine and about the, the rapid antigen cards, what are known as the Binax cards, and how you can get those for, uh, uh, for your offices. So I'll stop there, and, uh, and thank you, Dr. Poro. Sure, and um, uh, we've got uh, in the chat box a link to the monoclonal antibodies that, um, you know, how to acquire them, uh, the science behind them, the evidence base that Dr. Zweifler just very quickly summarized. Uh, we've got a really nice um, three or four page document that really walks you through what this is and how it can benefit your patients, especially if they're older at high risk of complications and death, uh, or they have comorbid conditions. Uh, so please refer to that. We put the link in the, uh, in the chat box. And we also have uh, links to some of the sites around town uh, that are offering them in case you want to refer your patients, but we would really prefer uh, to work with you and get you set up to do your own antibody infusions because we do um, have plenty of antibodies to, to, um, uh, to, to give away. Um, and uh, it would be free of charge from the state um, to, to give those out to our, our partners. Uh, and, and like John said, um, it, it's just a quick one-time infusion. It takes about an hour with minimal side effects. And so it's really worth investing in, in having more uh, places where patients can access this, um, this, gr this great medication. All right, so I will, um, I, I will stop there about the monoclonal antibodies, and then we will pick up with um, all about the adverse reactions. Um, and so uh, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go through the, the slide set that I've created. Um, so please forgive me because, um, it, you know, the, the slide set that you'll see here I'm not gonna talk about every single slide, but I did want to uh, include them for your own reference. So you'll have them uh, to look at later in the packet, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through every single slide and I'll skip through some. So what are the components of the mRNA vaccines? Um, how do we counsel and prevent allergic reactions in our patients? Um, what are common adverse reactions? What is anaphylaxis? How do you treat that? And what are the reporting requirements? And uh, lo and behold, they've come up with yet another registry for us to uh, know about, and I will discuss what that is. In terms of what um, the ingredients are, uh, so what is contained in these vials besides the fragile hopes of our whole civilization? Well, they, they mostly contain mRNA, uh, lipids, salts, sugars, a little bit of sucrose. 
they're actually very similar, even though they're made by different companies. And, uh, and obviously these are proprietary products. Um, they each contain um, uh, mRNA that codes for the spike protein and they each contain polyethylene glycol. That polyethylene glycol is boxed because there are people that are allergic to um, that component um, and that, that may be leading to allergic reactions that we hear about. It's very rare, but that's kind of what people are saying is explains some of the allergic reactions that have been described. Um, the other things um, like cholesterol, you know, potassium chloride, sodium chloride, it's almost unheard of to have allergies to that. Um, so just to let you know, these are actually very simple recipes. Um, you know, it's less than 10 ingredients in these vaccines. Um, and and um, it, it, it just speaks to kind of what the medical miracle is um, because they have very few ingredients and they're able to still have uh, greater than 90% efficacy in the trials. Next slide. So um, before we go on, you should know this term called reactogenicity. Uh, reactogenicity is, um, is just a really fancy term that just, th that means that your immune system is working against uh, this vaccine. Uh, and, and so it encapsulates just a whole series of different constellations um, of, of signs and symptoms. Um, and you know, if people show reactogenicity, then you can use um, uh, antipyretics such as acetaminophen and analgesics such as um, ibuprofen to help with, um, with, uh, with, with the reactogenic compounds. Next slide. So here's the takeaway from this section of the webinar. Uh, this is, you know, who definitely cannot get vaccinated and who can get vaccinated and who should you have precautions with. So I'll start at the right and move backwards. If your patient says, I had an allergic reaction to an mRNA COVID vaccine before, don't vaccinate them again. So basically, if somebody has an allergic reaction to the first dose, unfortunately, they're not going to get the second dose um, unless they go talk to an allergist, immunologist, have some kind of desensitization consult, and then they can go ahead and get their second dose. So that's the red box, right? And that's really the only hard contraindication to vaccination. Um, you'll notice that on this list is not pregnant, breastfeeding, wants to have a baby later, uh, has immunocompromised for X, Y, or Z reason. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of other comorbid conditions and a lot of other um, uh, patient uh, factors that people are gonna to come to you with. And none of those are hard contraindications to vaccination. The only contraindication to vaccination is if they had an allergic reaction like anaphylaxis to um, the, uh, the, the vaccine itself or to a component of the vaccine called polyethylene glycol. So that's that second bullet. So if they're telling you, you know, I carry an EpiPen, I've seen an allergist and the allergist says that I have an allergy to polyethylene glycol then that's a component of the vaccine and that, that should give you pause. And then, you, you know, that person should probably not be vaccinated in your clinic because it's just um, considered too high of a risk. Uh, in terms of um, precautions, you know, if they carry an EpiPen for other reasons, because they're allergic to peaches or strawberries or peanuts, uh, or they've been told that they have an allergic re reaction to the influenza vaccine, you can still go ahead and give them this vaccine. Um, you should be a little bit more cautious um, in which case we're gonna recommend that you observe them for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes after their shot. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't give them the vaccine. Um, so even people with a history of food or medication or a vaccine allergy, um, you know, they can still get the vaccine. Um, they, they're not necessarily excluded from getting it. Everyone else, I'm allergic to penicillin, I'm allergic to the dog, I'm allergic to the cat, I'm allergic to latex. That doesn't really matter in the context of uh, this vaccination, uh, they can actually get this vaccine. Uh, and then you'll just have to decide whether you want to observe them for 15 minutes um, or 30 minutes. If they've had a history of anaphylaxis to anything, probably a good idea to observe them for 30 minutes. Otherwise, everybody else just observe them for 15 minutes, which is the standard default observation period for everyone. Next slide. So there's some language at the CDC that you can actually hand out to patients. Uh, and this has a link um, just where it says accessible version. Next slide. And this is the bottom of this page. This is a one page handout. You can print this out, have it in your office. I really suggest you start carrying this right now so people can start reading about it and people can kind of um, get their questions answered even before they come to you on shot day. 
you really want to make shot day as efficient as possible. And you want people to have all of their questions answered and be really interested in getting the vaccine the day that they get their shot. So please, uh, you, you know, um, uh, inoculate them with information before you inoculate them with the vaccine. Uh, and you can have this kind of information just sitting out in your office and in your lobby or send it electronically to your patients so that they have a chance to take a look at it. The CDC has a lot of language um, and a lot of handouts like this that are for patients. Um, the other big question that we get is, you know, what if they get another vaccine very close to the mRNA vaccine? Uh, so technically, they're not supposed to get any other vaccines um, within 14 days before the administration of other vaccines. So, um, you know, if they had a flu shot, you want to definitely have them wait 14 days before they get this shot and vice versa. It, does it happen? Um, I, I think it probably does. Um, if somebody forgets to tell you that they had a flu shot just very recently or some other it, um, uh, vaccination that you might be giving them uh, for shingles or whatnot. But, um, you know, technically you're not really supposed to mix this vaccine with other vaccines and you're supposed to space them out by at least 14 days. Next. Um, so let's talk about the actual after they get the vaccine. So suppose you've kind of screened everybody out that you're gonna to need to screen out and suppose you've actually given your patient a vaccine. So now we're gonna talk about some of the side effects. So the most common vaccine effects are really related to the immune system. And that's where that reactogenicity term comes from. And that's basically the immune system is really going to start fighting off um, the product that's, that's created by the mRNA, which is the spike protein. And that's going to lead to symptoms of usually local pain at the injection site, uh, fatigue, body aches, maybe a fever, um, uh, headaches, um, uh, and all of these should improve with NSAIDs. Uh, not everybody needs NSAIDs, but um, if they do need them because they're severe, they can go ahead and get NSAIDs. Notice that these vaccine effects are not pointing to the respiratory system. That's the key takeaway is that if they are pointing to the respiratory system or if they last longer than 48 hours, you really have to think about something else like they have another infection going on or they actually have COVID itself. And so if, they, if they're telling you, you know, I have fevers and now I can't taste or smell anything, that's not a vaccine side effect. That is very red flag for COVID itself. They should be tested for COVID. Same thing with coughing, shortness of breath, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Really um, patients that are getting the vaccine and having vaccine related side effects should not have any of these symptoms that you see on the right side. Next slide. So there's localized reactions. Um, there's kind of psychological reactions. So I know this is funny to talk about, but some people do get nervous on shock day. Uh, they can actually have syncopal episodes, fainting. Um, they, you know, we've actually had that happen at the fairgrounds, believe it or not, as people have had some, some of these um, episodes. They're usually easy to take care of. Just have the patient lie flat and put their legs up. That's the best thing you can do for somebody that's just having a general vasovagal syncope. Um, and the patient just needs a little bit of time and then they'll get better. So just keep that in mind that that might happen um, and you should prepare your staff for that. Next slide. Uh, with serious allergic reactions, the CDC has just described um, the, the experience with both the Pfizer and Moderna products. With the Pfizer product, they noticed that there were 11 cases per million doses uh, based on the first 1.8 million doses that were um, given out. And with the Moderna product, it's actually 2.5 cases per million doses. So it's even less. And most of these happen within the first 30 minutes, as you can see, um, definitely within the first um, 60 minutes for um, non-anaphylaxis type of reactions. So that's where that 30 minute um, time frame comes from. I mean, you know, the, the 30 minute time frame was set up even before this paper came out, but this sort of confirms that that's actually the, the interval um, at which we should watch people for uh, uh, allergic reactions or anaphylaxis if they're a higher risk. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go through this JAMA paper, um, um, which describes um, what anaphylaxis is, but you should know that you know anaphylaxis is uh, can have a range of different symptoms, um, including uh, muscle aches, hives. What we really worry about is shortness of breath and um, and, and, a, and a feeling that the throat is going to start closing. Some people start to have GI symptoms that are very severe, like vomiting. That's very unusual after a shot. So if they start having vomiting and they're telling you that their throat is closing, or they start to have itching and hives. Those are all very high risk. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that you should be watching for. Next slide. 
So this, the JAMA paper um, does describe, you know, the, the series of patients that, um, and exactly what they had. And you can read that on your own time. I'm not going to belabor that. Um, I thought that this was a nice slide that just shows you all the things that you need to have in place, which are the necessary supplies to manage anaphylaxis, a way to screen potential recipients, and observation periods, um, and, and uh, the recognition of signs and symptoms, um, which you and your staff should be trained to do. Um, and then immediately suspect any treated anaphylaxis. So people that, you know, people that die from anaphylaxis usually have one thing in common. They didn't get the epinephrine fast enough. That's it. So don't hesitate. Just give the epinephrine. You're generally not going to hurt them, even if you're over-diagnosing, but you are going to hurt them if you don't give the epinephrine to them fast enough. Um, and, and really at your vaccination site or in your clinic, you should have all of these items available. Uh, epinephrine pre-filled syringe or an EpiPen, which we have a picture of. Uh, hopefully you know what those are. Um, our allergic patients are carrying them in their glove compartments and in their purses. EpiPens are great for a situation like this where you can just immediately do an auto-injector into their thigh. Uh, antihistamines like diphenhydramine are also recommended. Keep in mind that diphenhydramine is not a substitute for epinephrine. So that's the other big pitfall is you've made the diagnosis of severe allergic reaction, but you haven't treated aggressively enough because you've only given Benadryl orally and that's not good enough. You really have to go for the epinephrine. But Benadryl does help. Diphenhydramine does help for hives, uh, for itching, uh, just in terms of making people feel a little bit less nervous. Um, but it's not really going to help open up their airways if that's what the problem is. Blood pressure cuffs, stethoscope, a timing device to assess pulse, uh, and a pulse oximeter. Uh, these, are, these are all things that um, are, are, you know, obviously would be beneficial to have. I don't want to. I don't want to distract everyone to say you need to have all of these items at your clinic. That's not the point of this. At your clinic, you really just need to have one thing, which is an EpiPen. Everything else is is kind of icing on the cake. You can have albuterol on site. You can have antihistamines on site. What you really need is an EpiPen and a phone, because what you're going to do is give them epinephrine and then call 911. Um, and, and that's really what you need to know about um, treating anaphylaxis in the context of vaccination. Obviously, anaphylaxis treatment and allergy treatment is very nuanced, and I certainly don't want to insult any allergists or immunologists that are listening in today, but for the purposes of what we're trying to do, which is mass vaccination or very efficient vaccination of a large population, that's really the best case scenario is you just make the diagnosis, give them epinephrine, call 911, where they can get um, uh, more intensive medical treatment from our EMS and paramedic colleagues and transport it to an emergency department where they can get the full treatment, which might include things like steroids, IV fluids, et cetera. Next slide. So um, again, keep going, please, Sim. So here's a protocol that I put in. I really like this protocol. It basically gives you the doses also. Uh, just remember 0 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine IM is what's recommended, and that's what's prepackaged in the EpiPens. Uh, there's also something called EpiPen Junior for uh, pediatric patients or small patients, um, which has half of that dose. Uh, but really, even a full 0 0.3 milligrams IM, which is in the thigh, is, is not going to, like I said, overshoot, and it's only going to help the patient who has a bona fide anaphylactic reaction. Next slide. So here's what EpiPeds look like. Again, I'm just trying to give you many, many resources that you can look at and share with your staff um, on your own time. And really make, make sure you take the time to go through this. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna belabor it today, but really um, make sure you know how to make the diagnosis, urticaria, angioedema, which is swelling of the lips and the tongue, flushing, itching all over, and then a sensation that their throat is closing and they have respiratory distress. So make sure you know how to make that diagnosis clinically. If it is going to happen, it's going to happen within a few minutes and up to 30 minutes after they get their shot. And then once you make the diagnosis, don't look back. Just give the EpiPen, call 911, and then, um, and then uh, um, uh, EMS will come and, uh, and help you out with this patient. So again, we're not expecting that this will happen very frequently. Like I said, 11 cases out of a million doses we have a million people in Fresno County, so we should have only 11 cases of, of this happening. Uh, and if it's the Moderna, it's actually two cases out of a million, so that'll be even less. So we're not expecting a lot of allergic reactions that will require epinephrine, but we do want to be able to treat them uh, the right way if they do happen. And that's why we're really stressing um, that you need to know about anaphylaxis. 
Um, you might have heard that a Moderna lot was put on pause last week, and that was just because they had more than one or several reactions, but less than 10 at a mass vaccination site at Petco Park. Um, they actually, um, the state went in and did a good investigation, and in the meantime, they asked everybody to hold off on using that Moderna lot just in case it had some kind of a contaminant that was dangerous. But they found that they really couldn't find a reason why uh, this Moderna lot should be held. So then um, on January 22nd, um, just a couple of days ago, um, the CDPH um, announced that the lot is now okay to use. And so that put 330,000 doses back into circulation that were otherwise going to get either recalled or, or wasted. So that will happen. Um, we wanna work with you to find out about any adverse reactions that are concerning to you. So just contact us. Um, that's the short answer. If anything kind of strange happens in your vaccination clinic or with your patients, I definitely want to know about it, and my team wants to know about it, so we can help you. There is a registry called the VAERS registry. Um, I have to tell you that it's required by law, um, but you, you know it, it's up to you um, what you want to report into it. Um, the next slide will have um, the things that I think you should report into it. But they they basically want doctors to report any number of things, you know, death, life-threatening adverse effect, that makes sense. Obviously we do need to report and talk about if that happens, but things like inpatient hospitalization, a persistent or significant incapacity of the ability to conduct one's normal life functions and trying to tie, back, tie that back to a vaccine that somebody got weeks or months ago, um, congenital anomalies and birth defects. Um, you know, I can see the value of doing that, but unless you're actually following a pregnant woman all the way to her, her delivery, um, it may be hard, again, to tie that back to the vaccination itself. So um, I don't know that this is the, uh, the best tool to really track down all of these effects, but uh, you know the, the, the federal authorities are um, taking the, the position that more data is better, especially in light of a new vaccine that hasn't been studied very much. Uh, if you agree with them, then please sign up for this vaccine adverse effects reactions uh, reporting system and report into it. Um, otherwise, just let us know, and, and you know, if we feel like it is a significant reaction, then certainly we're going to report that to our state partners, um, and we will work with you to help you get that reported. The next slide has um, the, uh, the, the actual way that you report into it. There's several different ways. You could report online, or you can report using a PDF form, and I've included um, uh, this information just so that you have it, um, and we're ready to help you if, if you want to report any adverse effects through this mechanism. But I just don't wanna burden you with yet another registry that you have to sign up for because that's one of my biggest complaints about this whole vaccination program is that there's way too many registries and that this information can probably be streamlined into a single reporting mechanism. There's also something that patients can do which is download an app called BeSafe. So this is a sheet that we hand out to all of our patients at the fairgrounds um, and which I got myself whenever I got my vaccine. And, and this is an app that I've downloaded on my phone. And basically every week or so, it just comes out, you know, gives me a little bulletin to say, um, hey, how are you feeling? Are you having any adverse effects, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a way to track people uh, through their smartphones to see if they're having any adverse effects of the vaccines. It does not remind them or schedule them for second dose appointments. So, you know, that would have made a, a lot of sense, but for whatever reason, they didn't put that into this app. Um, and so it doesn't actually help with getting them rescheduled um, for their second dose appointment. Next slide. So there's a lot of other questions that I'm sure you're fielding because I'm fielding them about long-term effects, what happens in pregnancy, you know, what are the effects on fertility, breastfeeding, what are some vaccine-vaccine interactions. I hope I've given you some, um, some, some indication about these topics, but if not, the, the CDC has an excellent FAQ. I mean, they have literally uh, dozens and dozens of questions about all of these topics, and they have really good answers to all of them. And that link is shown at the bottom of this slide. So please go through that FAQ, especially if your patients have specific questions about these topics. In general, like I said, there's no evidence that the, these vaccines are um, harmful to women getting pregnant. In fact, a new MMWR shows that 5,000 women have gotten pregnant since uh, getting their vaccines in the healthcare workforce. Um, and it doesn't seem to have any adverse effects on fertility uh, or breastfeeding. Uh, vaccine, vaccine interactions, like I said, we haven't seen any, but the, the safety um, uh, message is to not uh, do vaccines within 14 days of each other. And, and like I said, I hope that you have a good sense of what the hard contraindications are for giving this vaccine, which is allergy to the first dose and allergy to polyethylene glycol. Next slide. 
Okay, so we've already reviewed this. Next slide. Sorry, I'm going kind of fast because I want to save time. Uh, and don't forget that if you are handling dry ice, that's not benign. Uh, you know, putting on my other hat as a toxicologist, um, I, I, I do have to mention that dry ice in closed spaces can actually sublimate into carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide can be an asphyxiant. Uh, so just kind of really interesting that you know you don't want to be transporting this stuff in your car with the windows up, for example. And you don't want to be in a very small room wherever dry ice is off gassing. If you're in a relatively large room or you have good ventilation, then it's really not a problem. Um, but just FYI, um, just something else to uh, think about with this vaccination cold chain that I, I don't think that um, we appreciate as much. But if you field questions about it from your staff, just let them know. It's extremely safe as long as you're in a big room that's ventilated. Key messages, learn to recognize anaphylaxis. Use prompt treatment with epinephrine and activate EMS um, if you do get uh, any reactions that you don't feel comfortable treating on site. And I think that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I went a little bit over, but you'll have all these slides to review um, uh, on your time. And, um, and here's my email. If you have any other questions, I'm always happy to get emails from you. Thank you. All right, I don't know if Rick has joined. Um, Rick, are you on uh, from, from uh, the Spock Clinic? Um, I think Rick, Rick was going to um, share his thoughts uh, during the Q&A about the uh, Spock experience and some of the lessons learned with a drive-up clinic, because I know some of you have asked um, questions about how to do a drive-up clinic. And uh, so just remember, Spock is partnering with the Department of Public Health, and uh, they've been great partners with us. They've been able to distribute thousands of vaccines in a very short time. And uh, if, you, if you do want to do a drive-up clinic model, then they would be really good resources for you to consult. Um, and, and we'll try to hear from Rick during the Q&A session. Let's keep going because I think um, the next presenter is, um, is it Dr. Brock's back on? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great, perfect. So you're gonna talk about the volunteering. Yeah, take it away. Thanks, Tim. Great, next slide, please. So the first, before we get into actually uh, volunteering to be part of our uh, Fresno County uh, team, I just wanted to emphasize what other speakers have pointed out and that is the important ways in which you can contribute uh, within your own practices. And it's not necessarily that you, that you do vaccinations in your practice, um, but certainly we're gonna talk uh, of, about uh, volunteering with the Fresno County. Uh, you can volunteer with other agencies. You can um, be a thought leader within your uh, circles of influence. You, you know, as, as, as physicians and, and medical professionals, we're, uh, I, I believe that we're a well thought of, uh, uh, group in society and we have influence uh, in many different ways we can we can encourage our our own practices to to support a vaccination project we can uh, talk to our patients when they're there we can have ma materials available at our offices uh, we can encourage our, our staff to ask um, um, people when they're coming through if they've had their vaccination if they're having any trouble getting an appointment uh, and and uh, we can work together we can write blog and post on social media. These are all ways in which we can simply be part of a unified message for our community that this is a, a safe and important uh, a, a project. And, and so that's the first part. When, who do we need to help uh, the, uh, the county in, uh, program? Well, we're forming different uh, teams. We have the, vac ma the vaccination sites. We're going to be forming some uh, uh, teams going out into communities to do uh, specific events. We're also forming some visiting vaccination teams that visit particular institutions. To be aware, as you volunteer, there are two job descriptions. There's clinical and there's clerical. The clinical are, are all of the uh, licensed uh, healthcare providers authorized to give uh, vaccinations in the state of California, and that includes our dental colleagues. And, and when we work together, there they, um, just go back to the slide again, please. Just, it just, it's really important to recognize that we're going to be part of a multidisciplinary team and our team lead uh, may be a different discipline than we're used to, but this is really a great uh, opportunity for us to work in our community in these teams. Next slide, please. So when you, uh, when you arrive at our, 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 um, our site, we've gone through this a little bit in the previous presentation, but the site will be organized. 
each area will have a lead and these uh, are functional areas uh, we've discussed previously and, and mentioned and we can glad to discuss this further next so i've been asked what about the sort of liability and this has also been dealt with uh, previously uh specifically uh as uh, uh, volunteers to the uh, fresno county uh, department of public health you will be enrolled under a program each individually enrolled under a program called the disaster uh, service worker um, uh, code and you'll be uh, be registered um, and uh, it's important that to be to have the protection of the disaster service worker um, uh, that you also have this uh, oath or affirmation and the County employees uh, will help. Can can we can administer this in a self-administered sort of way with the uh, online PDF? But that's part of the process that's important. Next slide, please. I've also been asked about what happens if a disaster service worker volunteer gets injured, um, and uh, what I've been told by the uh, by the uh, people that helped me with the disaster service worker sign up is that a, a volunteer disaster service worker uh, who has an injury. Would be treated as a uh, a California workers' compensation claim, and and so there is protection for injuries that occur to the worker. Next slide, please. We've also been asked about students and learners. So, with regard to um, the uh, residents who have either a full license, they're no problem. We'll take take them. Those with postgraduate training permits, we we're waiting final confirmation. But right now, it it, it seems that they will probably be able to be enrolled. As, uh, as clinical uh, uh, disaster service worker volunteers. And we're not expecting, we're expecting that to be confirmed. What about students who are not yet graduated? Um, and for disciplines that would be eligible as vaccinators, this includes our, our nurses, our uh, student uh, pharmacists, our, student, our medical students. Um, they, what, what we've worked out is that they will be enrolled as supervised uh, disaster service workers and they'll be given slightly different uh, credentials and they will be able to work when directly supervised at the site um, uh, with an appropriate ratio. And we're thinking that the ratio right now would be a ratio of one to four. So that if there's one faculty member who is a registered disaster service worker volunteer for each uh, four supervised disaster service workers that we can, uh, we can use um, these um, uh, clinical uh, students in these disciplines as part of the, the uh, vaccinator team. We can also use them unrestricted as part of the cl uh, cl uh, clinic, excuse me, as part of the clerical team. So there's there's opportunities for them to be, be clerical without supervision and potentially clinical with the appropriate uh, mentor supervision. Next slide, please. So some of the details I've been asked about equipment and uh, personal protective equipment are uh, uh, provided by the county. We ask you to arrive uh, with a mask in place. Uh, the uh, dress uh, dress code is, is uh, work that's suitable for a clinically working environment. Uh, if it's at the fairgrounds, be advised that the buildings are chilly. Uh, waters and snacks are available. We will eventually, we, we're working on making sure that each uh, worker is issued a, an identification tag. These are, are in process. I've been asked about uh, rec recognition. And, um, and we're working on that, but please be advised if it's somehow important that this volunteer service, uh, that, that you have a letter for your boss or for some other purpose, I will uh, work with that individual to make sure that a appropriate um, uh, certification and letter of appreciation for their volunteer service is prepared. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, the clinic is working uh, six days per week from eight to five. We're looking to extend these in, in all directions. And this will change and vary. And so for volunteer workers, we can basically accommodate four hour shifts. Um, and we would expect also some deployment with mobile units. And these are uh, a work in progress has been described in earlier parts of this webinar. Next slide, please. For those that want to sign up, this is what the, uh, the uh, Fresno County uh, COVID-19 uh, page looks like uh, as of yesterday. And on there, you'll see a disaster service worker volunteer registration form. And uh, I've marked that out. And that's the link you use to get to um, uh, starting the, the process off. Next slide. There's my contact information, including um, my, um, my cell and my email. 
And again, I'm, I'm working uh, hard to try to uh, stay in contact with everybody. Please, uh, I am working down at the, uh, the fairground site, which at times can be a, a fairly in intense environment. And if I've been slow responding to you, it's, uh, it's, it's not because I'm not interested in making connection with you. And um, I'll, I'll be, try to be um, uh, diligent in getting back to everyone. And if, and if somehow a message fails to get through, just send it a second time and I'll, um, and I'll certainly uh, try to respond promptly. Any questions, I'll take them during uh, either now or, or however it's, uh, however we've got this webinar organized. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brox. We now have Letty Berber. Uh, she's our PIO and um, she's gonna be talking about outreach and education and sharing some of the messaging that we've developed in partnership with Fresno Madera Medical Society. Uh, and, and like Dr. Brock said, this is an area that we really need um, all of our clinician partners to help us with as well, that in addition to vaccinating people, we do need to put on a, a really good effort to educate our, our general population as well. Uh, thanks, Letty. Thank you, Dr. Vora. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Letitia Berber. I'm a health educator for the Fresno County Department of Public Health Community Health Division. During this response, I am the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, lead PIO. Um, and next slide, Sam, please. I went ahead and added a picture here of our team. I know the public information officer seems like, a, sounds like a one man job, or in this case, a one woman job, but it's not. It is a team of uh, individuals, health education specialists, and we are working very hard to get that communication out to our public. Uh, these are our duties. As you can see, uh, most of uh, uh, the team members here are behind uh, the black screen, behind the, the website. This, this is a list of uh, some of our duties. This is, we create news releases, coordinate press conferences and, and media coordination. Uh, those health alerts and updates that you see coming to your offices are written by our uh, public health uh, physicians. But at the same time, we do take uh, part in those and making sure all those I's are, are dotted and the T's are crossed and just uh, advising on the type of communication uh, that the doctors should be receiving. The website design and content, that's our responsibility as well. Flyers, infographics, uh, campaigns that you'll see, uh, those TV commercials that you see from Fresno County Department of Public Health, that's uh, our work as well. Coordination of presentations. Uh, right now, Sim, uh, who is part of the team, um, is uh, coordinating this, this presentation as well talking points, uh, translation of documents, our uh, language th threshold here in Fresno County is Hmong and Spanish. So we wanna make sure those, every flyer, everything that we create are uh, in those languages as well. Another thing that we are doing is uh, coordinate communication with other PIOs from the state. We work very closely with them. Hospital PIOs, we meet with them every other week just to see where they're going in regards to communication. Uh, and share communication um, analytical analytics with them as well. We also partner up with community-based organizations. So we're working very closely with them to disseminate whatever information we create. It goes out to them and it goes out to the languages that those community-based organizations uh, are working with. Another thing that I did not add on that list was our uh, Facebook page, Healthy Fresno County and our YouTube channel as well. Please, um, like our Health Fresno County Facebook page. It's, and that's not just for us to be popular or just be the most popular web page site out, out, out there, but that also help us um, give any analytical results of our campaigns. Uh, it is difficult to measure how a PSA did on the radio or on TV, but in social media, we have the capability to measure the uh, the the but the, uh, the results of how it did in social media because of those likes, because of those comments. So please share our Facebook page to, with your clients, like our Facebook page, very important because that is one way we will measure our campaigns. And uh, Sim went ahead and put that on, on our site, that's our webpage, uh, our uh, Facebook, Facebook page. And all those uh, media briefings that Dr. Vora uh, does, they go live on Facebook page. Again, uh, the more people with, uh, sign up for it, uh, the better, better analytical results we get for our campaigns and, and so forth. Thank you, Sim.
And the next slide is our website. Um, we are, our main website is the Fresno COVID-19 website. There you will find um, sections of, uh, or sub, sub web pages that, that will assist you, especially with the signing up for being a COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccination uh, uh, um, distributor or, or provider. Uh, we have the second link that is the, uh, the link to, uh, direct, that goes directly to our medical provider website, COVID vaccination. Our webpage and the third link will go to the um, COVID vaccination information for our public. So we have those two sub web pages uh, focusing on the VAX uh, process, vaccination process. There, if you, Sim, if you click on the second link, just to show them that there on that web page, you'll receive, you'll see uh, plenty of information on how to the steps. On how to become a, provi a provider. And you'll also see where the clinics, where our clinics are, um, are located. You'll see a link to the Spock drive through clinic. You'll see a link to the um, clinic at the uh, Central East campus. Right now, there are no links available for people to register for those sites because they are full. But you'll see a map of the Fresno Fairgrounds um, map of directing people how to get to their clinic. You'll see those links down there to uh, register for the Spock drive through event and the United Health Centers that uh, drive through event at the Central High School East Campus. And there you'll find other additional resources that you may need. I think um, uh, Scotty and uh, the rest of the team went over those documents, the V-Safe and uh, the, the cold storage uh, hand, handling toolkit and so forth. So that is a, a web page that will just give you some information, everything that you need to be a, a COVID vac vaccination provider. And the last link is the uh, COVID-19 vaccine information for the general public. And that is, that is where we are going to be placing in the future of where additional clinics may take place. Right now, all these slots have been full, but there in that area, the public will be able to see links for them to register uh, according to the uh, whatever clinic is going out in our community. Uh, right now, again, individuals 75 and plus are, and healthcare workers are the ones we're focusing on right now. Uh, so that message that Sim is pointing out will change as soon as we start opening the doors to 65 uh, and over and whatever tier we're working on on that, on that week. If you go to the next slide, Sim, again, but yeah, the webpage can be translated English and Spanish. Um, again, uh, next, here's the vaccine schedule. Uh, this is uh, in the works. Uh, for be, uh, being translated in Spanish and Hmong as well. And it will change uh, as we finish each phase or as we enter each phase. And the updated uh, date, uh, very important if uh, you can see the updated date down there on the bottom right-hand side. So we'll be keeping this up to date. It's gonna be very fluid as we enter to different, uh, different phases. These are the educational materials, some sample of educational materials that have been developed and approved by our department. Uh, we uh, borrowed them from the CDC, branded them with our logo and are ready to be distributed. You are welcome to use them as well. They will be, um, we'll have a link on our webpage where you can go and download it for your use, for your, uh, for your practice, your clinic, whatever site you are utilizing to vaccinate your clients. Um, good idea to post these uh, in there. On the next slide are educational materials that are in progress. Right now, they, they're not finalized, but we really wanna create this myths and misconception uh, flyer for the public. And uh, that's in the works right now. Uh, our medical, our physicians are looking at it making sure that uh, the uh, education there, the, uh, the content is, is, is appropriate. We also want to develop a maybe a five by seven card that will be handed out to individuals receiving their vaccine on um, what to expect after receiving the vaccine, what they should be doing uh, after they receive the vaccine, 
many individuals think that they, because, because they had received the vaccine, it's okay for them to take the mask off. That is not a message that we're not ready for that. It's their first dose, very important to keep their mask on. Uh, when they go to public places, uh, social distancing, washing their hands, very important to practice those, uh, those preventative measures after their first dose. The middle flyer there is a uh, flyer that we are work still working on, and that's information on the second dose. Uh, still, we're working on the information that's going to go out to the public on the second dose and when they're going to receive it. Is this going to go through um, an email or is this going to be done through a phone call? Is this going to be posted on our website? We're still working on that content. We're still working on that way of, of sending that information to, to the public. So these are in the works, but they'll be available in our website soon. Our best shot campaign, hashtag our best shot campaign. Um, this is a campaign that we are uh, and that we are working with the Fresno Madera Medical Society. Uh, it's a collaboration between us two. Uh, we have, um, the plan is to develop a series of videos with community influencers and deliver that message about the importance of that vaccine. The questions that we ask these uh, individuals as they, are uh, as they are being recorded in the video is, why would you get your vaccine? Why should people get the vaccine? How has COVID affected you in a professional way, in a personal way? Those are some questions that, that we asked in order to get content for that video, in order to make it into a PSA. We plan to utilize these videos uh, as PSAs in radio, television, our YouTube channel, Facebook, and other social media platforms. Um, and that's, how, uh, that's one way to uh, use them. So, Creating digital ads are very important with images of the community influencers. Uh, when this uh, digital ad pops up on a website, people will have the opportunity to click on that, on that digital ad. By clicking that digital ad, it will take them to their co our main COVID-19 uh, web page. Videos can be used in television located in your waiting room. So once those videos are developed, you are welcome to call us or go to our website grab that video that you like or grab that video from that influencer that you think will match up to your population, play it in your uh, waiting area, in your lobbies, and uh, to send out that message about the importance of vaccination. Videos will be shared with local community-based organizations for further distribution. Again, um, we wanna, uh, these videos will not only be in English, we have uh, speakers that speak in Punjabi, Hmong, uh, and Spanish. So our CBOs will be able to utilize those uh, for further distribution of our message. We are working with uh, JP Marketing. They are helping us uh, create this, um, this campaign, uh, buying um, time on our radio, purchasing time on our radio, TV. Uh, uh, they're dealing with that, that buying power that they have with those media uh, partners. These are images of individuals that have taken uh, place in creating those videos. Uh, again, our best shot campaign. We have Alma Moreno, who's a farm worker. She delivered uh, that video or those message, those questions. She answered those questions that we asked, uh, and uh, we were able to go out there in the field and record her. Dr. Bautista Jr., Dr. Sablon, and Alexander Sanborn, who is um, sign language, he was able to record his video with a translator. Dr. Sablon did a great job in explaining how the vaccine is made. Another uh, important uh, project that we're working on is creating a, an animation video on how the vaccine is made. And we plan to utilize Dr. Sablon's story on how that is made by creating some type of animation, showing how um, that, that vaccine was made uh, and create maybe a, a one minute, two minute video uh, for you to use on your lobbies or for us to use on our YouTube channel. And the next slide will show additional uh, community influencers that have created this video, Mayor Dyer, Dr. Bautista Sr., uh, Teresa Noriega, who is uh, wheelchair bound. She also delivered that message as well. We have other individuals in line. On Friday, we recorded a, a pastor from the African-American community, and we uh, recorded someone in Punjabi who delivered that message in that, in that language. So we'll have a compilation of videos out there in our community, and you're welcome to use those uh, we will have a link to these videos on our website and where you're going to be able to go there and grab those videos and utilize them for your, for your uh, message as well. 
and that is what we are working right now in regards to communication to our public. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Letty. Well, uh, you know, we've uh, reached almost the end of our webinar. You have asked great questions in the chat. I hope all of you are participating in the chat. Uh, we've tried to answer uh, many of them as best as we can. Um, and uh, if there's any other questions that you wanna just unmute yourself and ask, this would be a great time. Um, uh, otherwise, if you need to jump off, that's totally understandable. I'm happy to stay on as long as we need to to answer everyone's questions. Um, and, uh, and I just wanna thank all of my panelists Fresno Madera Medical Society, um, Stacy Woods, um, Sim, and Letty, and the rest of the communication team. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better organized webinar. So thank you so much for, for really helping us out with this. But let's open up the chat lines and uh, question lines and see if there's any questions anybody has right now. Hey, Dr. Voritz, Dave, I have one. Sure. So I, my question are, are to the primary care providers and I, I just am really wanting to see what ideas they have for us to drive their patients, you know, to what's the best place. We can do the fairgrounds and we'll continue with that. But, you know, over the next few weeks, if we can get the vaccine and we can get the, the systems in place, are there, are there barriers or things that we can work on collectively to drive the patients, you know, to a primary care location to get the vaccine and what might that look like? Sure, that's a great question. And no idea is off the table. Uh, you know, the more creative and the more out of the box, the better. Uh, sometimes that's where some of our best um, uh, projects come from is suggestions that, um, that are made by, by, um, by our partners. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, this is Oscar Sablon. <clears throat> um, the city of Fireball, as well as the uh, Fireball as Delta's Unified School District, have offered their sites as potential sites for mass uh, vaccinations. And so if we can work with uh, Fresno Madeira, with the Fresno County to provide the vaccinations, we can provide mm -hmm. certainly the personnel to, to help with the vaccinations in the rural areas. That, that's a fantastic idea. Um, we, we'd love to do that. Um, and that, that really aligns with um, the structure we have in place for some of the, the mobile and the pop-up events that we could uh, you know, organize a team of public health staff as well as volunteers such as all of you uh, to just come out to um, you know, a, a civic institution, um, a school, a church, uh, a, a community center uh, and then drive um, all of the members of that community uh, just through a, a lot of education uh, to show up there and to have a very organized um, um, uh, pop-up vaccination site. Thank you, Dr. Sablon. We, we've, we've discussed this um, and, and we've discussed your role in, in helping us with Fireball multiple times. Um, so we're, we're definitely looking forward to doing that and we hope that we can get that um, organized and planned uh, very soon. Thank you. I know that a lot of faith-based organizations um, have reached out to us. They're probably reaching out to you um, if you're a member of a faith-based community. And, and there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to partner with them. Uh, like Dave said, right now, the bottleneck is the supply chain and getting enough vaccines into our county. Uh, but we don't want to um, have another bottleneck related to the number of people that know how to vaccinate and the number of people that are ready to step up and vaccinate. So hence, hence this webinar, we really want all of you to be prepared and ready. We know that the vaccines can't come soon enough. We're doing everything we can to pressure the state uh, and hopefully the state can pressure uh, the federal authorities at Operation Warp Speed to get us more vaccines. We understand that that is the central uh, dilemma of this weekend and the weeks to come. But as more vaccine supply is available, uh, we really want to be prepared and have our medical community prepared to uh, actually administer the vaccination. So uh, I know that there's multiple registries and I wish it was different. Um, I, I know that, that that can present a challenge with how cumbersome it seems, uh, but we've been there and we've done it uh, and we want to help support you at every step of the way. 
um, and, and, and our staff stands ready to, to help answer your questions. So please keep them coming. Yeah, and I like uh, it's Susan Dominic's comment there about some of the smaller offices maybe teaming up to offer vaccination clinics on weekends at convenient locations. That, that's something I think we should definitely think about. And then Dr. Vora, can you mention Dr. Lynchite and her, how you have her task kind of with, with this project? Yeah, and I know Dr. Lynchite's been very graciously answering a lot of the chat <laughs> questions. Um, Dr. Lynchite is, is another one of our um, uh, staff physicians who's helping uh, with just a variety of different projects, uh, really related to educating our primary care workforce. Uh, so as a primary care physician herself um, and as president of the regional chapter of, of, of family practice um, physicians, uh, she really has a good pulse on that community. Uh, I know a lot of you already know her through that role, uh, but keep in mind that she's helping to support a lot of the educational outreach that we're doing related to testing and antibodies and now vaccinations. So I'll give her a chance. I don't know if she's at a point where she can um, speak up, uh, but she, she's actually um, leading a team from public health who will go through and actually answer um, a lot of questions over emails uh, and actually help um, get people registered into the CalReady, uh, not CalReady, uh, the CalVax and, um, and, and um, uh, care websites if they need to get registered. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Vora. This is Dr. Lynch on. Um, and I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to reach out. I can put my info in the chat to um, just really want to connect with our primary care, with our providers. And I did post in the chat earlier that if anyone on this call is a Sante provider, just know that Sante has a care account you can use. They, they have applied for CalVac, so you can um, contact them to let them know that you want to be signed on to their account, um, which will allow uh, all Sante providers to um, distribute to get vaccines and distribute those vaccines as long as you have the capacity to store them and have the temperature, the digital data logger temperature and stuff. So that, that's bit, that I think will be really helpful for a lot of our providers to kind of streamline getting, it, getting signed up for all those registries because Sante is able to do that as an organization for us. Um, and uh, yeah, I just if you're if you're having any difficulties with either the monoclonal antibody, just you know, getting giving that out if you want to get it, or get the getting the vaccines, please reach out to me, and I'll I'll direct your questions or answer them or, or get you contact or in contact with the person who who needs to kind of help you out with that. Great, thank you so much, Robin. Question for Dr. Vora. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, hi. I, I know that we've targeted the over six, uh, 75 and, you know, working down the, um, to uh, the over 65. Um, yes, sir. One of my concern, of course, is, is that with the rapid spread of the COVID-19 virus in Fresno County, as well as the surrounding counties, is mm -hmm. we see a lot of the spread as being the younger people, the people that are in the 18 to, mm -hmm. to the 40, 50 year olds. And when we're trying to open schools, uh, mm -hmm. any thought yet on, on when we can uh, vaccinate these spread spreaders? And I, I know that we're following CDC guidelines and all that, but any, any thought out there about yeah, changing no, the good, priorities? Yeah, no, good question. Um, so I don't know that the priorities will change very soon um, for several reasons. First, um, the trials and the FDA emergency use authorization really only permits age uh, 16 and over for the Pfizer and 18 and over for the Moderna. So, right. um, you know, those patients can get vaccinated, but uh, the thought is unless they have comorbid conditions, um, in which case they will be eligible soon, they're not eligible now, but you know, for your 25 year old with cystic fibrosis, for example, if they have comorbid conditions, then they will be eligible for a vaccine. Um, if they're otherwise young and healthy, then yes, it's totally a very difficult situation because we know that they can spread. Uh, they can get the virus, they can spread the virus and they would you know, uh, contribute to ongoing uh, transmission. So we do need to get them vaccinated um, for, for their protection and for everybody else's protection. There's just not enough vaccine right now. So, so you know, I think the rational allocation is to protect the most vulnerable populations, which are going to be towards the, the older end of the spectrum. So I think that's where the allocations have come from. Um, the CDC and the state um, is right now 
um, um, uh, recommending 65 and older and 75 and older, just depending on how much vaccine is available to the jurisdiction. Um, and then slowly they will move down and, and open up um, other age groups. Um, some countries have done it just only by age, just purely by age. And they said, we're gonna vaccinate our oldest first and then just keep going down. And the state is um, vetting a proposal uh, where it would be more, um, um, uh, a, a more emphasis would be given on age-based vaccination. But the way that the state's um, rubric is currently designed, um, it, it really is a combination of age-based which is 65 and older and occupation-based, which is the high-risk occupations. So, you know, for example, if somebody's in a high-risk occupation, then they don't necessarily meet the age-based criteria, then they would still go ahead and get vaccinated. And that's why we have, you know, 20-something nurses that are getting vaccinated is because being in a healthcare workforce, being on the front lines of the response um, at the clinical end puts you at a higher risk. Same thing with our law enforcement, our emergency services, et cetera they are going to get eligibility based on their occupation, but it's not going to cover every young person that we're talking about. And then for the below, you know, the teenagers and under uh, below age 16, those trials are just now starting. Like the 12 to 17 year old trial is currently enrolling. Uh, in fact, I have a friend in LA who's trying to enroll his kids into doing it. Um, so, uh, you know, it's happening. And I think that it, as the months move on, we're gonna have um, studies that just document that it's safe to do in kids. And then I think the CDC will then feel comfortable to say, okay, we now have the evidence in our hands to say, go ahead and start doing the pediatric age patients as well. Eventually, yeah, we will need to do that in order to really achieve the herd immunity in society, but we need to do the trials and we need to manufacture more vaccines before we're ready to take those steps. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're over um, the, uh, the noon hour. Um, I'm happy to uh, keep, keep going with questions and answers, um, but I just wanna thank you everybody. If you do need to jump off, we totally understand. We will um, archive this conversation um, and share the recording and, and also share out all these wonderful slides that my partners have been able to put together, uh, as well as all of the links and the transcription of the chat questions that you've, you've contributed. So I just wanna thank everyone from the bottom of my heart. This was such a great webinar. Uh, I certainly learned a lot from you and hopefully you took something away and have a better direction uh, among this blizzard of information about how to move forward with your vaccination plan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Not hearing, not hearing any more uh, verbal questions. Um, we will, I think, adjourn. I uh, just want to say thank you so much once again. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Bora. Great job.